Well, hello everybody, Uh, this is Justin Bell, your host on Life With Legends. What I've worked out that I love about motorsport is the ridiculous number of stories just waiting to be told. At every level, from each era, there are just these incredible personalities who contributed greatly to the development of our sport, and Jim Busby is one such man. Based out of Laguna Beach, California, it would be easy for anyone driving past to simply miss the world-class racing operation that has taken place there for over 50 years. Jim is one of those rare talents that could combine engineering and fabrication skills with this great speed behind the wheel. Hitting his stride in the heady days of 80s sports cars in the IMSA GTP series, his cars won multiple races as well as him winning his class at Le Mans as a driver. It was a great time of camaraderie and hijinks, but always balanced by intense competition, and Jim saw it all. Also, drag racing and the famous Bonneville Salt Flats benefited from his intense passion for all things fast, and being a true-blooded hot rodder, he made everything faster than when it got in his hands. What a cool guy, and great fun to talk to. We only just touched the surface in this podcast. He is a raconteur, so I may need round two. Enjoy. Obviously, ever since we came to your party, I was like, we have to do this, so thank you. Yeah, now I hope you're able to get some of this and this and this and everything we did. And I think the most fascinating part uh, about still being here in this building after 50 years yeah. is is uh, that we actually built every single car here right behind you in the fabrication area, this was the engine area. Yeah. And the benches were much bigger and it was a real working engine room. Now it's basically a museum of what we did and still continue to do on a limited basis. But that area there, the cars that we raced with your dad, with Bob Wallach, with myself, with the, all the guys that we had raced for us over the years were built right here in this building on that floor. And what we would do is we would get a Porsche. In this case, these cars were originally purchased by B.F. Goodrich and handed to us under contract. But during the course of a season, the hot rodders in us couldn't leave them alone. So what we'd end up doing is tearing them all apart, changing the chassis to get torsional rigidity, aero changes, everything else. And ultimately, uh, one of the best quotes your dad ever made when, when he was driving for us in 1989 was he, when, when he drove the number 67 car, which we won the Daytona 24-hour with and led every other race until the car fell out. He said, without a doubt, this is the fastest Porsche 962 ever built. He said that. And he said that. And right behind me in this room, you see the nose off that car, which I found in a garage in Canada as it finished the race. <laughs> and, that, and that was Bob Wallach, Derek Bell, and uh, John Andretti. Yeah. John, sadly, John's gone now, but the rest of us are still kicking. And, and you know, Bob was killed in a bicycling accident um, 20, 21 years ago yesterday. So it's ironic that here we sit today in the area where that's car. Scott Derek Bell standing with this. Yes. He used to race. Indeed. Bob Warwick was in your car. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. So, I mean, the, the crazy things that have happened by, by staying in one place for as long as we did is everybody somehow, some way wound up circulating through this building and driving the racing cars from drag racing all the way up through the the 24-hour races we did, yeah. not to mention the races that I personally did for other people. The Kramer brothers, I drove their 935 at Le Mans, we won. I, I drove BF Goodrich a 924 GTR Turbo, and that's got a story about your dad that's yeah. incredible. Because well, tell me. Yeah. what happened was, as I get a call from Joe Hoppen, who ran Porsche Racing in America at the time, he worked for Volkswagen North America, and he said, Jim, would you like to do Le Mans? And I said, sure. I did it in 78 with the Kramer brothers when I drove their car. And then a couple of Americans hustled some sponsorship money and off we went. 
and I was the paid driver and everybody else was the paying drivers, yeah. which is the way it tends to work. So I arrive at the Porsche test track at Weissach and I see the car sitting there and it's been prepped by Porsche with a super engine. And I look at the tires and they're street tires, but they've been shaved down to a little bit of tread, but they're, they're street tires. And I said to the tire engineer that was there, uh, Rick Schaefer, I said, Rick, let me ask you a question. These are the transport tires, right? We're gonna put slicks on this thing and we're gonna go racing at Le Mans. Well, not exactly. We've shaved these down and they're street tires and you're gonna run the 24 hours. I said, well, what if we don't even qualify because of the tire? We'll qualify, don't worry. And we did. However, the car had an engine problem and it kept acting up no matter what. It wouldn't make the boost, it wouldn't do this, it wouldn't do that. So we get the car qualified and the night before the race, there's two Porsche mechanics in their red uniforms working on the back of an open pickup truck in the paddock at Le Mans, rebuilding the engine out of the car in the rain. And I looked at my wife and I said, you know, we got, our engine, we got a dinner reservation tomorrow night, right? Because I got a feeling we're being going to dinner. She laughed and said, no, no, it'll be okay. This is Portia. So Portia and a handful of guys from uh, BF Goodrich and uh, Brumos, who actually owned the chassis, yeah. they finished the engine and they put it in. And the, that morning, so Doc had barely not in, been in the car at all during practice. I'd had been doing all the test driving. And our poor uh, French co-driver, um, Mignot, never got in the car, and so he was not allowed to start. So now we're down to a two-driver team to do 24 hours, which I'd done before, So because I, I did Daytona and all those races with two drivers before, when Hurley Haywood and I drove together, Peter Gregg and I, and so on. So anyway, I'm thinking, well, this is no big deal. Doc just does the whole morning warm-up. And as you know, the race starts at 4.30, so the morning warm-up is lunchtime. Yes. So the car trundles out of the pit and does not come back. And I'm thinking, where's Doc? Comes back on the hook with the back end caved in, right rear corner gone, rear window destroyed, wings gone, and so on. I'm thinking, we're going home. The, the car's ruined. Doc has arrived at Mulsanne uh, uh, with another guy, an inexperienced guy on the inside of him who pushes him into the outside tire wall there and destroys the back end of this car, which we're going to now race at 4 o'clock. So I think, what are we going to do? And, and here's the Porsche guys running around in circles, and all of a sudden they jump into action and they disappear and they climb the fence into the driver's parking area where your father's 924 GTR SS is sitting in parked. Yeah. And they take the wing, the rear window, the rear fender off the right side and the whole tail section off of his car, throw them over the fence, they're in red. Yeah. When you look at that car in the model right there and some of the photographs here, right there, there's yeah. the car finishing the race at Le Mans and winning the GT class. They then finished the car in time for the race and took black and silver duct tape and basically painted the car. The whole back end of that car in that picture is tape. Uh -huh. And Porsche mechanics and the, B and the BF Goodrich guys and the uh, uh, IMSA uh, crew they brought with them did it in silver tape. The car ran perfect to the end of the race and finished the race and won. Unbelievable. Clean sweep for Porsche. Your dad and Jackie win in the 962. I've got a photo around here somewhere of me finished testing at Weissach and Jackie's in the car and they both got loaded in the transporter that night, went straight down to Le Mans. Our car was trouble all test. You know, you test a lot at Le Mans, all night, all night, all night. And it finished the race. So many. And, and Doc and I did it alone. We didn't have any co-drivers. And we got it. And the cars that were in the class, of course, GT included Camaros with Gene Felton, good drivers. Yeah. And, uh, and we beat them. You know what's so funny about hearing Neil say to that story is I was there as a kid. 
was 14 and I remember dad like just me not being over the moon about me. No, I know they drove car. He, he, and it, he, he had just been given that car by Porsche. Literally. In 1902, <laughs> there arrived a gun house that spring. Right. And there it is. And he drives it to Le Mans. With us in the back. <laughs> so that was our motor transport. <laughs> sort of funny. You must sit here. And I always have a concept <laughs> stream of visitors. And when, Never when, stops. When you had your party the other day. Yes. What, a year ago? It was it was unbelievable to see the rain <laughs> of the scope of the people that came. Now drag race, yes, road race yeah. to in yeah. car to do you do you sit here and look and look at I mean this was the hub of it as you say yes the benefit to being here all those years is that everyone knows where you are they still do they still do yeah and sadly there's a set, there's a downside to that as well. Many of the people that have circulated through here worked for us, employees. Over 222 people worked here over the years. Over the time, yeah. And so consequently, when we had our big times getting ready for Daytona, we'd have 30 people working here. Now remember, it isn't just this room. What we call the Ferrari room, when I worked with Ferrari with their yeah. Cliente project, that was in that room, but that was still our space when we were racing, seriously, as a professional organization. The front house was my offices, secretaries, general manager, Michael Colucci, you know, the guys. The front shop was carbon fiber. We were the first people to convert all of the fiberglass on our Porsches to carbon fiber before the factory did, uh, and so on. And we then set up the presses for Nissan when they built their cars in carbon fiber. And my son sold them the presses because he was our carbon fiber guy. So there's history that goes here, but here's the downside to that history. Many of these people are now gone. Yeah. And, and when I think about it and I pick up Facebook or Instagram and I see so-and-so passed, you know, Jim Bailey yeah. left us yesterday. I didn't know. And, uh, and, and there's a picture of Jim Bailey and my boss when I was at Brumos was, um, oh God, um, Peter's right-hand man, because uh, I worked for Peter Gregg, but he, he couldn't hire me directly because he worked for BMW and I worked for Porsche at the time. Yeah. So anyway, my, my guy and Jim Bailey were best pals and I saw Jim Bailey every time I went there, every time I raced at Daytona, Sebring, Atlanta, because they had dealerships there and so on and so forth. And now these guys are gone. And, and I, I, it's the part of being here and being stable for all these years that bothers me because Bob Wallach's gone and Bob and I were only associated in racing uh, for two or three seasons, but we were friends forever. Yeah. And now Vic Elford, who taught me how to drive the Nürburgring. I arrived at the Nürburgring and I was in my little BMW that I'd bought in England and I drove from my house on the West End yeah. to um, the Nürburgring, the old, the Nordschleife, yeah. the real one. The real one. And I put my 50 marks in the guy's hand and took off for a lap and continued to do so to, to learn the circuit. Well, it was 14 some odd miles and 196 corners or something. And I'm lost. I'm dead lost. So I'm standing there talking to Guy Edwards and up walks Vic, who we'd, I'd met before at Silverstone testing. And he, he looks at me and he says, Buzz, you a little lost out there? And I said, more than a little. And he said, you want some lessons? And I said, I certainly do, and you're the ace, so let's go. So we get in my BMW, he rolls up all the windows so I can hear him and lights a Gawi cigarette. Those things stink. There's black French cigarettes, they're yeah. awful. And so I, I say, what about we crack the windows? How are you gonna hear me? And he's puffing away on those cigarettes. Well, you know, to, and, 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 and the day that he died, he was probably still smoking those cigarettes. So I say, okay, okay, I can do this. And I'm in there in the smoke cavity, rushing around the Nürburgring. And he says, so we're now we're coming down to Adenauer. And I say, okay, that's the village. And there's a bridge there and so on and so forth. Because I've done my homework. I've looked at the pictures. And, and he says, okay, you're not driving this entire racetrack. That's not going to happen. You'll never, ever memorize it. Think of this as seven different races. 
So you've been to Sears Point, you've been to Riverside, you've been to uh, all the racetracks all over the country, mid-Ohio. You know each one of those racetracks individually, don't you? And I said, yes. He said, okay. The first racetrack is from the start-finish line to Adenauer. Memorize it. Wow. We're going to do that. Then we're going to go from Adenauer to so on and so on and so on and so on. Pretty soon you got seven racetracks and you know them all, don't you? I said, well, I kind of got a feeling. So think of the start of the race leaving the town of, town of Adenauer and going to that racetrack. Yeah. And he, he said, that's what I did. Yeah. And that's why I'm so good at the ring and how you're going to be good at the ring. So by God, I'm in that Barclays Bank uh, two-liter car with Guy Edwards as my co-driver. I'm qualifying the car, and I put the car seventh on the grid after Vic's lessons. I, I couldn't have gotten around there with a co-driver in the car driving the car. I couldn't have gotten my way around, but with Vic's lessons, I did. And I finished sixth in the race. My very first race at the Nurburgring. That one, I mean, you only have to go there a couple of times to pay you. you Even figure out where you're going. I know. So, and he said, it's easy, the la end of the, set of the last lap is easy because you're up against the hedge the whole time. Yeah. So just remember that. You're looking forward to the hedge. And those were the lessons that he taught me. And Vic and I stayed in touch up until he passed. Yeah. I mean, he was, hey, such talent, hmm. not matched by a commercial personality, no. right? No, because he should have been bigger. Oh, yeah. right. Well, I mean, he had no money, he, nothing. Uh, you know, yep. That's nothing. nothing. But his name is mentioned in hushed tones for the skill he had, but he didn't have the package. Did he? Did you? Were you aware of that at the time? I was aware of it. As a matter of fact, Vic called me. Oh, God, I don't know. I, I had done pretty well in racing and put a little money in the bank. So And I owned this property outright. I owned my home outright. And and I had, my BF Goodrich contract was very lucrative, yeah. and people know that. So, and that was for 11 years. Wow. Uh, not consistency. Every yeah. single day. Yeah. And and I had the Cox newspapers, you know, when Fitzpatrick and I drove the 935s together and won those races, that was Cox newspaper money. And my paycheck came from them, not from Fitz, okay. and so on. So it's it, if you're in the business of racing, which your family well knows, what appears to be on the surface is not always what's happening. Yeah. And you, you may actually end up bringing money to a deal because from somebody else wanted to be in the deal, yeah. regardless of how good you are. Because the bottom line is, is the racing business operates on cash flow. And you better be in it. And I knew that early on. And I was a very shy guy. So I had a very difficult, I have a low voice anyway. Yeah. And I had a very difficult time in a boardroom and talking to people and trying to explain that this body shop kid who wanted to be in racing needed some of their money. And they're going, oh, wait a minute. Which university did you graduate from with honors? Well, no, nothing. The school of hard knocks. And um, so I... I read two books. By Z one was by Zig Ziglar, and the other one was You Can If You Think You Can. I think that was Zig Ziglar. And uh, Win Friends and Influence People. I read those books to learn how to talk. And then I could talk to anybody. And I, I'd go to people, and I I've put a deal together with the Cox newspaper chain, which sponsored me all through my BMW years, even though BMW gave me cars and engines and all that, as you well know. That's the least of it. And I hired people and had people around me that were good. I was basically a mechanic and an engineer myself, and yet not schooled. And so consequently, we operated here. Basically, the, the model we used here through all our road racing years was the drag racing, whereas it started out with a T-shirt, and then it was a quart of oil, and pretty soon it was 100 bucks and so on, and pretty soon you had an operation. But you got 10 or 12 of them. Every car that you, everybody said I looked like a corner worker because my driving suit had a million tags on it. You darn right it did. Every, if this was 100, that was 275, yeah. this was 1,000, this guy here was 4,000. So I, I knew that if I was going to be able to move forward in racing, I needed to have the input from people who knew how to do that and surround myself with people that could do it 
and learn how to speak and, and make sense and logically think through what I'm going to, I would sell this guy this part of the car for this reason, because he, I even had a, a dress manufacturer out of Atlanta one time, I did a, a, what was the Jade something, Jade David or something, no that was a different, yeah, that, that was a San Diego guy, that yeah, was, no one wants to bring his bank, well I, I drove for him and never got paid, oh, yeah, man. he owed me 5,000 bucks a race and he didn't pay me, lightning. Well, because Fitz got, they got hammered. But anyway, um, I finally figured out that one, I needed stability. I needed my own facility. You can't just have the, the, the jargon and the contacts. You, people need to walk in and see something tangible. Yeah. And so I was renting a shop in Costa Mesa, and it was $750 a month, and my landlord was the old movie star, um, what the hell was his name? He was one of the sidekicks on the Western shows. Uh, Andy, um, oh God, funny guy, big heavy set guy. Jingles was his name on TV. And his name was Andy Devine. His son, Tad Devine, handled his investments and built buildings in Costa Mesa. I rented one of them. In my first office, which I'm going to repeat in this office here, I had a pay phone on the wall. That's how I made my deals. I'd sit at my steel desk, which is still back there, painted red now, and I, I would take that thing and drop a quarter in and call people and keep adding quarters to make deals on a pay phone because what I discovered is the two guys that were working for me were using my phone, and so I took it out and put in a pay phone, and it was, I had it mounted on the wall right here so I could sit at my desk and make deals over the stupid Crazy. pay phone. And that's what I had to do. Well, I'm sitting there one day and Tad Devine comes in and he says, Buzz, you're late on the rent. I said, well, I'm kind of always late, but you know, you always get it. And he said, my dad's making a lot of noise and yeah, we got to do this. I said, okay, never mind. I called my friend, Steve Roos, who lived in Laguna, who was a real estate agent. And I said, Steve, what do you got down there that's cheaper than what I got? He said, don't have anything cheaper, but I got a building you can buy and it's got a fixed 30-year uh, fixed on it. If you can scrape up 7,000 bucks, which I borrowed from my parents, and bring it to me, you can take over the loan. And it's 750 bucks a month. I said, that's what I'm paying in rent, but then I own it? Yeah. So I did do that, and eventually I'm sitting in my office up front when we've got 30 employees out here, 962s and 218 wheelers and all the stuff that's happening. And my secretary walks in and tosses me a manila envelope about like this. And she said, the bank sent back your check. I said, oh God, we didn't bounce a check on the bank on for our monthly payment, did we? I don't know what this is. Open it up and tell me what you think it is. And I pull it out and my, my check for that month's payment is paper clipped to the top of the deed to this property. No. I had paid off a 30 year fixed, Unreal. month by month. Unreal. And now I have the pink slip on this place and I own it outright. And when it came down to last year when I decided to no longer take in outside work, which we had done, yeah. built all the Bonneville cars. There's nine world records in that cabinet for Bonneville cars. That one right there for one, breaking world's records. All, that in, all out of this workshop. And so I, <laughs> I, I, I sat down and I said, my house is paid for. This building is paid for. I own it outright. I got a little dough in the bank. I've been lucky in racing. And and my mother had passed away and left me a little too. And I thought, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to work anymore. I'm not going to answer to anybody else anymore. And that red house, which we had converted into a storage facility, had every single picture and every trophy that you see in these cabinets and neck hardware, and so on and so forth. Everything was stored away and rolled up in posters and rubber banded in that house. And I hired a guy who framed all these pictures. I found the model of my number 67 BF British car on eBay, brought it out here and refinished it and hung it on the wall. It runs, that car runs. And, uh, and every toolbox is the original and every drawer here is still full of the nuts and bolts and washers and titanium hardware and everything. So you you were able to take everything out of the dark, effectively, your whole racing life. Everything. And bring it out. And bring it here. Felt so good. 
Yeah, and so many people were nice to me. Uh, uh, Kevin Jeanette calls, and he says, Hey, Buzz, you know, I've got all your 962s down here because everybody that buys them sends them here, so which one do you want? And I said, I want that one. I want the one that we won the 24 hour with. Well, I got the Sebring car. I got this. I got that. I said, okay, whatever you can get. So we couldn't convince the guy to send that car. So uh, so the guy, uh, what's his name, the wonderful guy who's the chairman of the board of the New York Stock Exchange, oh, yeah. he owns two of my cars. And they're still restoring another one, which I'll finally see at Porsche uh, uh, Fest. And he just put the thing in a transporter and sent it here. He didn't charge me. He didn't want anything for it. And it sat here during the party. You saw it. Yeah. The number 67 car. And the uh, 935 that I put on the pole at Sebring in 77, the very first cheater 930, because it was supposed to be a 934.5, but we all know different. Yeah. Is Porsche is a really good hot rod company. The reason I did so well with Porsche and got along with them so well is because that's they're not a car company. They're a hot rod company. They make hot rods. I read, the, I read that last night, that you'd said that in our tour, Motor Trend, yeah. a long time ago. Yeah. And, and so let's jump back on that. Yeah. You, it's like, Rhino Bruce Mars, a great friend of yours, and when I see the people that he attracts, I know in my crowd, the car racing, right. racing. Right. And there's a whole other side. Yeah. You guys that were the Calum Yes. Horrors. Yes, we were. And then I talked with Pink, and you know, you realize his start, you know, his humble beginnings and going off to war and coming back. And he building can't. engines for man. Build, did he? Yeah. Uh, he, you can't underestimate the, or how do we even do that? A perspective to a new generation on what Paul brought in. It's pretty so, easy. Uh, I can tell you exactly what happened even prior to me getting involved. Okay. When the Second World War ended, there was an awful lot of guys that had been hanging around in England and France and Germany and Switzerland and, and, and involved in ingenuity making tanks run that didn't run, getting weapons to unfreeze. You know where the, where the saying, piss on it, comes from? No. If you're in a trench in central France or at the Battle of the Bulge and your M1 sticks, it freezes up because of the... It's, you yell out, my weapon's frozen, it won't fire. Somebody yells back, piss on it. And you piss the and the warmth of the urine loosened up the mechanism and you're shooting guys again. So those guys who learned how to piss on their M1s and learned how to get a tank running that wouldn't run and fix a Jeep and run it, put a log on one side of it to drag it because the tire's gone and you can drag it with the other three. Those guys came home. And they came home with GI Bill money in their pockets, and they went to junior colleges because the, your education was paid for. Yeah. And they had been in England, and they'd seen a Triumph motorcycle, not a Harley Davidson, that had a little buddy seat on it. And the front end was dropped, and the Springer was taken off, and they had big Springer stuff on their Harleys. They came home and modified their motorcycles. They modified their hot rods. And I worked at the Passa Green Body Shop as a paint prep kid in Pasadena. And all of these guys came home on the GI Bill and they all had money in their pockets. They weren't married and they had hot rods because they'd taken the fenders off their 32 Ford and hopped up the flathead that was in it, just like they'd fixed the tank motor in Germany. And they built hot rods. And the first races were on Colorado Boulevard in Pasadena. And that was my dream. I rode my bicycle every day from my house three blocks away to the Pass Green Body Shop and sanded cars to learn about hot rods. And I met all these guys that were in the Pasadena Roadster Club. When you look around in this shop, you see a car club plaque collection. Mm -hmm. There's one car club plaque that's in the center there. And that's called the Night Riders. And that was a Pasadena car club with all these XGIs had come home and joined this club and they raced on the streets. So the police ran them out of town and said, you can't do that. You were banning your club and they did. So they didn't, ban the, they didn't ban the club or disband it. They changed the name to the Pasadena Roadster Club, which exists today, and all hot rodders that are anybody that wants to be in a serious club, they join the Pasadena Roadster Club, which is the remnants of the, of the, of the night flyers. And so I found the number one car club plaque, which would have been on the president's car, and in a trunk of a car that we restored for a client here, 
and asked him if I could buy it, and he said, sure. And I, th I was waiting for the $10,000 ticket. 25 cents, give me a quarter. And I got it. So, so it was very representative of, of the rest of your life. You saw these guys. Yes. You were a young man. Yes. And you just... There's a boy. A boy, but so inside him. Huh. To be a wrong person. That's all I thought about. There was no regulations. There was no... There was my thing strictions. No. You could, basically, if you could imagine it, you could build it. Yes, and you did build it. And you did. Because that wasn't there wasn't an option. Yeah. You built it or you didn't have it. Yeah. And when we got to a point with cars, which we had contracts with different companies, and that car wasn't in the hunt, mm -hmm. what did we do? We put on our hot rod gear and we fixed it. What yeah. like you did with the nine six two? Nine six two was a car that was actually built here. The tub was built by Jimmy. Um, Chapman, who did the Indy cars, and he had a jig. So I said, I want a honeycomb tub. These things are dangerous. Uh, a couple of guys have been killed at Le Mans in them, and I hit the wall at uh, Miami and folded the front end up over me and broke three ribs and dislocated my shoulder. And I kept thinking, you know, when these 962s first came out, uh, and Derek and Jackie had been so successful in them, and then some privateers had gotten them and done it, they had about 600 horsepower, max, and tires that hadn't been developed to the point that we were at this point. So the impact when you had a mistake was not nearly what it was now. And all of a sudden, um, what was his name that was killed at Le Mans? Wonderful guy, drove with Bob Aiken, and oh, nice kid, wonderful guy. And man, my friend at BMW, whom I drove with, Manfred Winkelhock, had been killed in Canada at Mooseport. And I was there. And um, I thought, boy, th these tubs are just not going to take it. And then poor uh, Beloff, yeah. the tub folded up on him. Mm -hmm. It's not Porsche's fault. There was nothing wrong with the cars. They were now going 35 or 40 miles an hour faster on stickier tires. And, and we had to do something. So now one of our Ed Pink qualifying motors and a lot of the Alvin motors were in the 900 horsepower range. Mm -hmm. And that was to qualify, but we only turned them back to 800 to race. That was 200 more than the car was built with on stickier tires and better aerodynamics. So I decided that we would make a, 930, a 962 that was safe, and we did. As you know, we modified the bodywork and all that sort of the Nissan thing at the back, lowered the wing, made that part of the aero package, sealed up the front end, lowered, ran the car lower. We used all Porsche corners and suspension. That was the best, the transmission, the end base engine, everything. But Ed Pink and, and Alvin had figured out how to modify all the electronics, and Alvin's motors won an awful lot of races for us, but Ed Pink did a good job too. Yeah. And he was a hot rodder guy. Yeah, I mean, it hinged it as a. He just, when I interviewed him about it, when we had our conversation, his curiosity yeah. his, about engines was pal palpable. It's like he just looked at the, at the Porsche engine, like, I, it, you, didn't it, you send him to. So he went to in Europe, Germany, didn't he? It's yeah. went a month or two yeah. until he knew everything they knew. Yeah. And then came back and beat them with their own engine. Yeah. And he didn't always beat them. Alvin's engines have won all the races, too. So, I mean, you know, your dad's the perfect example of that. Few people benefited more from Alvin's engines than your dad. And, and I did, too. But remember that when Alvin was a mechanic at a Porsche dealership and I was needing my engine rebuild in my RSR Carrera, which we won in one year, we won six or seven races yeah. with that little car right there by beating the faster, bigger BMWs and all that because we hot rodded it. I took a look at the cylinder heads and I said, how in the world can you get air to go like this into the piston? Yeah. Yeah. That won't work. And I'm a hot rodder, so we need to change that. So I read the rule book and the rule book said, okay, look, uh, you can do anything to the engine by porting it or polishing it. And then I thought, well, we're not gonna interfere with anything. This is an air-cooled engine. It doesn't have water jackets. So what we're going to do is shave the whole intake side off the cylinder head in the mill, which happened in that little mill right over there. And we're going to make a manifold, because manifolds were free, that's in the rule book, that fits down into a hole we're going to bore down. Once you look in this hole, all you see is the head of the intake valve. And I called Alvin and I said, what's up? And he said, you know, the 16-cylinder Porsche engine 
based on the nine, uh, what was the big, uh, 917, um, that had that look. You could look down the intake port and see the head of the intake valve. And I said, that would flow twice as well. So I went to my drag race buddies up at um, Cylinder Head Service in San Fernando Valley, two blocks from Ed Pink's, and I said, okay, here's this thing I chopped up at home. It's one cylinder head. They have six separate cylinder heads. So that's another advantage. And I want that slide valve trumpet to look straight at that intake valve when we get done. He said, what are you going to do about water jacket? This is air-cooled motor. We don't need that. And, and he says, okay, and he does it. We would ran it on the dyno up on uh, Signal Hill, Alvin and I did, yeah. 34 horsepower. 34 horsepower out of that little flat six. And so all of a sudden, I went up mid-Ohio, I went at Riverside, I went in Ontario, I went at God knows where else, all over the place, Sears Point, and so on. And all, I only lose the championship because Porsche sent me a 934.6, to, which is a f five with a little trick. And, um, and the flywheel falls off while I'm leading at Daytona. And I go, oh, great, easy. It's so, <laughs> so, you know, my generation had nothing to do with our cars. Right. Right. I mean, right. Coming in in the, in the 90s, but I mean, guys like you, being here in the 80s, seeing dad race with more in the 90s. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was this whole world of American IMSA racing. It was so vibrant. And oh. when you tell people in the 80s, effectively that IMSA was bigger than NASCAR. It was bigger than anything. It was bigger than it. It was the best road racing in the world. Yeah. Period. And, and you didn't have a Derek Bell and a Jim Busby and a Bob Wallach controlling the outcome like Formula One is now. You had 20 cars that could win the race. 20 cars. So the spirit of, we have to be better than the next car, there was no oh. BOP. Yeah. There was no balance of performance. Nothing. Bring what you could. Nothing. Beat the guy with what you had. And John Bishop's attitude toward regulation was what made him so. And John Bishop, everybody, was the, was the founder, John Bagley Bishop. Of oh. well, IMSA. Yeah, which was International Motorsport Association, which started out racing Formula Fords under the auspices of NASCAR. Yeah. With a paycheck from NASCAR. Yeah. His attitude was really quite simple, and you can talk to anybody that's currently affiliated with IMSA that knew the Bishop era and the people that worked there, the Raffoffs and those guys. I don't care what you do. I want the racing good. If it's not good, I'm going to nail you. So did we stretch the rule book? Oh, yes, to its limit, time and time again. Did we get caught? Yes. What happened? Nothing as long as the racing was good. It was based on how the races looked. And the, the quote that came to John Bishop from the head of NASCAR, Big Jim France, was, don't stink up my show. That's a quote from France to, and so I don't care what you do, don't stink up my show. Don't run away. So don't run away, right? That's what they don't want. That was the NASDAQ philosophy. So you could build a mega engine. You could find the better aero balance in the car. But if you ran away with it, they would say. And they'd jerk your motor out of your car and take it. Okay. So you had to play the game. Everyone did it for the to beat each other, but also knowing the end result was great in today. What it did is it created an equal playing field for people who were incredibly skilled engineers mm -hmm. and also others who weren't and were incredibly skilled racing drivers. And we all ran together and we ran hard. And, and when I, four of the races that I won in 76 against Peter Gregg, who was my sponsor, he owned Brumos, and I drove their car. He hired me to do it. Yeah. It's all in the book. Yeah, yeah. And I punted him off the road to win three of the four races that I won over him where he finished second to me. And in the fourth one, fifth one, he tried to dump me off the track at Laguna Seca on the final lap starting up the hill. And by hitting me, he spun, and I won the race anyway. So, so That's we, how tough everyone was. And we hit each other. We did not screw around. No. And we, those cars came back beat up from every single race. That car had so much body work done to it after every race because I'd hit somebody and pushed him out of the way. Yeah. 
And look, if if you've got Al Holbert or Peter Gregg stuck up your tailpipe, and you come up on, or you come up on a slower car, what do you do? You get the slower car out of the way. Yeah. Talk, talk about how you just said something interesting, which was, you know, you had these great engineers and and mechanics, and you had these great drivers, but you were both. Do you think that was a pretty? You had Al Holbert, who arguably was one of the best all round. Al, Peter, and I were the class of the field. You and but I, driven by engineering or driven by driving? Both. It was both. And I lost here. My dad didn't have that, but Wally didn't have that. Yeah, but I never. And ask Jeff Yates. None of them had. I never. I never so. trusted myself to be the fastest racing driver. I didn't trust it, so I had to be better engineering wise and get the car better. And I, I, I was the only guy that brought freight grain scales in the back. I had a trailer that held my car, and parts and toolboxes and four freight scales, which they'd made the, the grain on those to feed the livestock. Yeah. And then I calibrated those and I made a, a water um, level that was a long piece of tubing with two tubes on the end with lines on it. And I'd take the scale and at Mid Ohio in the garage, which was like Old this, yeah. I'd put the scale there with blocks under the wheels until I could go from scale to scale to scale and see the water at the same level in the plastic tube. And it, it extended, I'd do that scale to this scale across. And when the water was at the same pot in both one, those scales were level. I'd put the car on it and scale it at the racetrack, jack weight into it if I wanted to, and I, I'd use those scales all weekend until I was on the pole. And I, and I, and I wouldn't and do anything. And then when I got to mid-Ohio and, and I was beating them all, I'd already won the regular race. Now it's a big lumberman's race. and and I decided to do the race alone. And Hurley Haywood and and um, and uh, Peter Gregg are in the BMW and Ronnie Peterson or somebody else is in the other one and so on and so forth. And I'm in my little old Porsche alone, no co-driver. So I take my helmet off and we grind out grooves in it, put copper tubing in it and have two copper tubes that stick out here. And then a little ice chest down here with an electrical switch that controls it. I still have the blue driving suit, which is in the other room that I'll show you, with two holes punched right here in it that I wore at that race. And I put a boat fan off the bilge of my boat on the back of the seat with two holes in the seat that pumped air from the outside window into this and there, and then a thing off the top that had two tubes that went into my suit, and it blew me up like the Michelin man. But it was fresh air from outside. And of course, if it had been a fire, it would have baked me to death, but you don't think of that. And then I had this copper tubing up against my scalp, which would have killed me if I'd hit anything, and and this little ice chest, and I'd switch it on, and all of a sudden my head would go, oh. So like the first cool seat. Yeah, right. And you, you, well, I did the... How to do it. Because he, no one knew what he cared about the result, yeah. not how we got there. Okay. And that's NASCAR today, believe it or not. Yeah. Did you, so, did you find that... While you were doing these innovative things, was it rewarding to see the knock on effect in the paddock? If you were, they would do it. If you were meddling the scales, tech didn't do that. No, the, the tech guys were barely able no. to do that. And the IMSA tech, tech, no. So you, you knew that by going to the grassroots on certain things, just doing what you would do, the best you could do in every area, and gave you the best shot. Yes, because I didn't believe I was the best driver. Okay. And I thought if I relied on being the best driver, there's a couple of racetracks where I clearly, at Mid-Ohio, nobody could touch me no matter what. I don't even know why. I have no idea why. I just did well there. Yeah. Other places, I really was bad. St. Louis was terrible. Um, you know, and it, at Sears Point, I was really good. I won every race I ever ran there, including in my Formula Ford days. Similar the tracks. Yeah. Maybe you like the elevation. Maybe you like the... I liked it that you came over over rises to nothing and had to land the car. And I wanted the car to land on the outside tires. And I wanted, I, I always drove the cars on the outside tires. So if the car was predominantly right turns, my left side had to work. Yeah. And, uh, and I always did that. I did that even in the 962s because remember that I was, I did the test driving on these cars that your dad won in. Yeah. 
and then I was an old man. I was at that point 51 or 52 years old. And your dad was not that far behind me, but yeah. he had maintained being a super driver. Yeah. I never was. Yeah. I was a pretty good mechanic and a guy who wasn't afraid to push the rule book. Did you, so you rated that then? A lot, yeah. often. Did you enjoy racing? I did, but he never made any mistakes, which was just revolting. <laughs> and, and what I did, I'll never forget this one. I was driving Fitzpatrick's car, and John and I were the same speed, basically. John, at certain places, was faster. At Mid-Ohio, I was faster than he was. But we were a pretty close match. And John was one of the best guys I ever drove with. Oh, my God. That guy, he would always bring him back alive. Always. Mechanically, physically, they always came back alive. And, and a very reliable, very quick guy. He always out-qualified me. He was always quicker than I was in qualifying. And he just had a sense of how to use the boost knob, and that was critical. And your dad did too. That was a thing that we all got good at because Porsche taught us how to turn the boost down and up at the right and wrong time. And so on. <laughs> well, never stop. You, it wouldn't be unusual to turn the boost up to leave the corner and then turn it down all the way down the straight so it didn't overheat the intercoolers and boil the... I had no idea. Yeah. It would be a week. I've always just looked at it as a static thing when I jump in a light six two. You guys were fiddling with that way. Like. The nine thirty five is where it all started. Because the nine thirty five you could hurt them. They were still they were not electronic. And they had the old the, the mechanical pump. And so the fuel curve was not perfect to the engine. So if you over boosted that thing, you'd melt a piston, you know, crack a head and so on. So we would, one of the tricks would be to, let's use the Laguna, Laguna Seca, what was turn nine, now 11. Let's use that one. So now you come in on the brakes really hot out of turn eight and the, and the brakes are hot and, and the car is good. Well, this is an understeering car on turn in because it's got no weight on the front axle. It's got a ton of weight on the rear axle. So what's gonna happen? It's gonna go from push, push, push to snap over steer. So what do you do about that? Okay. You rely on those huge rear 19-inch rear tires to squat down and get you out of the corner so you don't spin. And so you come into the corner kind of loose. Otherwise, it's going to push the front end. You get down and get the... If you can get to the front axle to get to the apex of turn 9, 11, uh, now you're in the driver's seat in terms of what's going to happen because the car's going to spin out now because you've over you've run a lot of rear brake yeah. and you've almost locked the rear tires and you're going oh my god so the trick now is to have the boost turned up so braking into turn nine you're turning the boost way up and you get the car turned and when you see the front tires are at the apex you put the throttle on the floor yeah and the and the lag and by the time the turbo lag it squats down and lights the tires and off you go. And now you're going to overheat the intercooler, so you're going up the straight, turning the boost down. <laughs> and, that's, that. and that's what you did. That's why I mean, that's great pictures of the cars coming in. Oh, my like, God. You, I mean, yeah, I mean, if we look right fair enough, you're going to, yeah. see, you're going to see pictures of Whereas, but it is, it's, it's part of the joy of learning to drive different race cars, isn't it? That yeah. They had the, they had the, Character, yeah. you know, it's like the way guys drive 911. Right. You know, there are some guys that just live in understeer hell. Yeah. The other ones, Patrick Longs, are these yeah. people that can, can do it. There was no understeer in that 911, right? Yeah. Why? Because the wheels weren't in the same place that we were in the last the factory. I get a call from the guy who restored that car about 15 years ago. 20 and 35, right? And so, so he. He says, I just wanted to put all new fiberglass on the car and the wheels don't fit in the holes. And I said, oh, oh, gee, I don't know what's going on there. And I said, oh, my God, you've got the factory body work, right? Yeah. I said, listen, there's a company called Mitcom, which was a sponsor of mine on the top of the window there. Oh, yeah. And they did all of our fiberglass. Well, I had moved the front end. Um, I had moved the rear wheels uh, forward, no, back. Yeah. And the front wheels back four inches. So no wonder that body work. And the body work didn't fit because I had moved it to get the weight more on the front axle, and and consequently I began winning a lot of races that way. So 
And that wasn't against the rules. It said you had to have the original wheelbase. It didn't say where it had to be. It didn't, be it didn't say put it here. That's and so that's what we did. We did it right here on this pad. And um, anyway, so I ran that car that way. And so we got a lot of the base understeer out of the 911 with that. Plus, we had a lot of torque. And I learned very early on about lots of rear brake in rear engine cars because that's where the weight is. And so these were the things that substituted what I believe to be my less than superior driving abilities. I had to make the car better. So there was no mistake about whether or not I was going to be competitive because my car was going to be competitive. And then if I happened to be good there, okay, so be it. But let's not bet on it. And, and remember that I drove my first professional race at 29 years old. And, and I did that in that car right there by convincing Eric Broadley that Barclays Bank was going to open branches in America and they didn't have any American racing car drivers in the two-liter series in Europe. And I talked he and Guy Edwards into bringing me to England in that car. And then I convinced Barclays that we should fly the car back and forth from Europe to America to do SCCA races, national level, and I won every one of them and qualified for the runoffs and finished second to Jerry Hansen in the runoffs by using the same car in Europe that we used here by using airplanes. And, uh, and I had modified that car. We changed the cockpit. As you can see, it has an opening, and we changed that. And so that was at Silverstone testing the first day. And I had never been in a race in Europe, and I'd never driven in the rain. I didn't even know what the rain was. I lived in California. Yeah. So at, I was racing at Le Chatre in central France, a little tiny racetrack there that with a lot of really famous people. Jack Brabham was one there, Dan Gurney's one there, and so on and so forth. So I get a call from Barclays, and they say, we want you to go to France and race your car at, at Le Chatre. And I said, well, that's not part of the championship. What, why? And they said, it's just really prestigious in central France, and that's what we want. Okay, so I go there. I trundled around a very simple track around a city square kind of a deal. And, okay, so I do okay. I qualify, I don't know, fifth or something like that, which is about where I was in the field of the two-liter cars. And that. Uh, I never raced in the rain. I wake up in the morning, it's raining. I go to the racetrack, it's raining. Here, eh, but, that, but it's going to dry up. We're good. So we got slicks on the car. Slick's only been around for a couple of years at this point. Race starts, and I trundle around in fifth, sixth the whole time, and I think, eh, I'm doing okay, this is all right, I'm putting on a decent show. My wife's there, my kids are there staring through the fence like this, and uh, all of a sudden the rain starts. Then the deluge starts, and pretty soon the monsoon starts. And I'm going, oh, man, I'm sliding, I want slicks. And, I, and, and, and I'm sliding around and I'm doing, I, I'm barely staying on the road. I'm going through the grass, I'm, but I'm staying out because I, I don't know about stop. I've never stopped for, for rain tires in my life. Don't even know what it is. And I, um, <laughs> I don't see anybody because I'm going so slow that it, you know, I can't, they're all running away from me, obviously, but nobody lapped me. So I'm thinking, okay. So I God, when will this ever be over? And I come out of the last corner, and I'm coming up to what would be the start-finish line, but you can't see it. There's so much rain. And a guy jumps out on the track with a checkered flag and does this and jumps back out of the way, and I go, oh, God, thank you, and I slow down and limp around, and I come in the pits, and there's a whole bunch of people waving and yelling at me, and I'm thinking, oh, God, I, they're, I really oh. fucked up bad. And so, so, but then I see my crew running toward me with the checkered flag. And you're like, no. And I go, and? I said, you won the goddamn race. You didn't pit. And I said, I couldn't. I didn't even know where the pit line was. I never had been on rain tires. I didn't know you did that. And I had won the race by staying out in the stupid rain, and everybody else pitted, and they had the troubles I did. And they did shortcut the race by about five laps at the end. And I, I won the stupid race. Yeah. On, on, on slicks. I love that. So that's the kind of stuff where my lack of experience made me have to think a little deeper than some of the other guys yeah. did. We, 
Do you, do you ever consider yourself brave? You a brave guy in the race car? It was very clear that I was stupid. Okay. Whether I was brave or not, I don't know. But I, I nothing scared me. I, I always thought about what do we do to win and what do I have to do to win? You know, a perfect example is I demolished that driving suit, which I'll show you with the holes in it. I would have been bumping fire into my suit with that thing. And I took a perfectly good Bell 500 helmet. It was looked just like that one. That's the very first Troy helmet ever painted right there. And I, what I did is I took copper tubing, which, which uh, dissipates heat very, very well and brings cold as well. That's why refrigerators are all copper tubing. And I got this massive 12 feet of copper tubing and I'm up there with a die grinder in my helmet grinding out a groove laying gl glue in the groove and bending the copper tube into these grooves all inside this helmet with two little stubs sticking out which we shove um, yeah, you so want to think about the then other side you're thinking only of the other side what's the gain what's the gain and if I hit my head yeah you were in a mess yeah <laughs> you know <laughs> so, so you were kind of a member of two fraternity what Two fraternities, really. You the, you've got the drag, you've got the hot rod drag guys. Totally, it they, like I'd never crossed until I got came to California. I didn't. It was a mythical beast for me being a British kid. Yeah, but you remember that club, but then you also remember the road racing guys and the road racing club. Literally, what was the difference between the mentality? Because you obviously crossed over and bought some to both. I did both, but, but my what was it? Well, well, I had worked at Dan Gurney's. I was a fabricator. If you ever go into Gurney's now and you see those two big tables that they use for jigging and building the Indy cars, Larry Stellings, uh, uh, Pete Wilkins, and Jim Busby built those tables. And I worked there, and, and I'd park my dragster on its trailer outside the back door at Gurney's, same building, and Gurney would let us off at 4 o'clock every Friday afternoon, and the drag racers, Stump Davis, Larry Stellings, and Jim Busby, would get take take our dragsters to Carlsbad Raceway on Friday night and race them on top fuel, and and we did that. And Gurney understood it, and Gurney was fascinated by the drag racing okay. because of what it brought to road racing. Yeah. And so I sort of thought about that. And later on, I went to work for Charlie Hayes, the Can-Am driver, building the four-cylinder engines for the Formula Fords, Formula B cars, which became Atlantic. And I built those engines, and I did it with drag technology, with CCing the heads and doing all the stuff, which the road racers didn't do. They just got the engines, plugged them in, and off they went. And I didn't. I thought, I'm not going to be the best driver. i got to make my engines the best. And I drove in the Formula Ford series, and I won, of the 13 races I drove in Formula Ford in those two seasons, I won nine of them because my engines were just super. And... Uh, so and I knew about negative camber because I'd worked at Gurney's. And I worked at Charlie Hayes's. And when I saw the level of people that were coming in to buy road racing cars and racing them, they were generally wealthy. And this was a hobby which had turned into a profession. And I kept looking at them and thinking, mm, you know, I, I think I could beat these guys. I think I could beat him. I don't think I could maybe outrace him. I don't know if I could outcorner him, but I think I can beat him. Yeah, yeah. And so I'll make sure that I do this and I do that. I learned how through watching them more closely than I watched myself what I could do to win. And that I based my entire career on that. So it's a great philosophy, isn't it? It's like not, it's not, you know on a level playing field it can't have it. I didn't think I could. No. And I didn't think and I didn't think there was a level playing field because I thought a guy's checkbook could make up for any shortcomings. Also they were bringing in these hot rod drivers, hot rod well yeah. pop shop for Yes indeed. Oh, yes indeed. Been here before. Right. They cut their teeth on Formula One, which you've got to say, especially at that oh, time, oh. what made them better drivers oh. than you had get a problem. Oh, far better. With one exception, Mario. Mario. He was the one that went the other way and taught them. You know? And and he brought he brought California to Europe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about their personality because that's what really excites me as well is you and that first time, first hand experience of these people that we consider heroes now, 
but legends, but you were you were watching them learn yes. to grow, yes. get better. I mean, who? I mean, Mario is such a he's, he's an Mario. exception. He's an exception. There's no doubt about it. Mario uh, is an exceptional r racing talent. He's a smart guy. He's an exceptional businessman. Yeah. Yes, he is. And he knows a car, and he knows what it'll do, and he can take it immediately to the limit. He's immediately. Smart. I watched him. Yeah. Give me an example. Oh, my God. At the Speedway, you know, he won the Speedway in a car that wasn't going to win. Yeah. How? He got through the corners faster. He figured out how to make that thing go through the corners faster because the engines all came from Ford. Those, those, yeah, yeah. I rebuilt a lot of those uh, dual overhead cam Ford IndyCar motors because I put two of them in a dragster. There's a picture of it right there. Oh, okay. Yeah. And... And so I knew those engines. I knew they were bulletproof as long as you didn't burn the pistons. And Mario knew when a motor was going to operate on the edge. And he'd come right in and say, no, 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 you got to put some fuel in this thing. It's running lean. And he knew it. So, but not from him. I mean, yes, he did. Tell no, he just knew what the car felt he like. Felt, he, he felt it. He'd probably feel the car leave the corner strong because it was rich enough and taper off down the straight knowing it was going lean. And and he could feel that, which I could never feel it. No, yeah. he also had that unassailable, unshakable self confidence. Right? He, I mean, it seems that that was a part. Of and that. and for some reason, even though he was small in stature, he was a very intimidating guy. Well, he and, said, and and he would sit and look at somebody and talk to him, and they'd know they couldn't beat him. Yeah, and and he was that way. Yeah. And I saw that from a mechanic's side because I worked for Charlie, Quester Grand Prix. Yeah. I, I built the engine in Bobby Unser's car. He blew it up himself by over-revving it and blamed it on me because I built the engine. And, uh, and I watched Mario at the Quester Grand Prix. I watched the other hot dog guys from Europe. Yeah. And I knew right away that I would never be able to be a race driver and beat those guys as a driver. I had to have a better car. That was the only thing that was going to win. And when they, when the Chevy uh, engine was put in Guy Edwards, Barclays bank car, it didn't have a head gasket, and I knew that it would leak and that it would, the engines would be dropping out of the races. So I opted for a, who was the guy that built those four banger Cosworths? Um, oh, God, a real famous name in small displacement European racing engines. Anyway, I, I, I ran the Ford in that. It had the top of the block was metal, and it wasn't going to, the cylinder head wasn't going to shift and blow the gasket. And so I finished every race. And I was in the paddock at Misano, and I had, the timing belt had broken on my engine, which is the only engine we had. So I'm out going home. I'm in Misano. I'm living in, oh, on the west side of London. Yeah. I don't want to go home. I don't know garage for that car was in a little muse uh, on the west end and our next door neighbor was alan decad and yeah. he was he was restoring rolls royces and bentley's and that kind of stuff and he had aspirations to go to blamont which he did in one yeah. so anyway i uh i'm thinking i don't want to go back to that i can't i can't do that so i think okay i'll rebuild the engine right here on the ground on the in the paddock at uh, misano I took the mechanics to get the head off that thing. Well, how do you do that? I said, well, start with the valve cover. That's yes. in the way. <laughs> we got to get the head off because it bent the valves. And did they think you were bucking? They thought I was absolutely fucking out of my mind. And these guys were experienced guys. And uh, so I knew that there was a truck repair. That's a big town there. It's on the Adriatic and everybody from Eastern Europe vacation there so it's a fairly busy area and um so i say well just get the head off just get the stupid head off and and we we can get a belt from somebody around here belts were changed frequently because you'd see them frayed and you'd line up the top pulleys in the crank and change the belt and off you go so i knew how to do that so i said okay here's what we're going to do we're going to, we know that the pulleys are no longer lined up and the valves have hit the pistons, so now we're screwed, but it's our only engine, so here we go. Uh, can we find a head gasket? No, can't find a head gasket. 
So I say, never mind, get the head off. And I take the head and we get the valves out by taking a wrist pin and pounding on the retainer and the keeper flies out and I get the valves out and they're all bent. So I go to the truck repair station in Misano at lunchtime and I, I give the guys a hundred bucks. That's American hundred, that's a lot of money. And I say, okay guys, you got a valve grinding machine like that one. It was like that snap-on right there. And I want to straighten out these valves. Well, they're bent. You can't just grind them. I said, no, I'm going to straighten them first. Give me a vise and a hammer. And I would put them in a vise, and I'd turn them around and measure the distance between the edge of the vise and the head of the valve and tap it with a hammer until they got pretty close, probably within about 25 or 30 thousandths. They wouldn't seal, but at least they'd go up and down. And then I put them in the valve grinder and ground it down to nothing. And I estimated how much I ground off and got a truck shim and put it under the valve spring. So we still had valve springs. Put the things back together at their, with their valve spring presser. I let them, they let me use it. And they didn't speak any English. They were all Italian. And I got the head back together, threw it in the rental car, back to the track. And we take the, the uh, I had K&W block sealer, which I always kept around for sealing up water leaks. And we soaked this used head gasket in, in K&W block sealer and, and lay it on the block and it's oozing out the sides. And we put the head on and, and now none of the valves are compressed because I, don't, I haven't put the, the keepers on top. The cams aren't in. And so we get that on, we torque the head down, we get that down and it's oozing crap everywhere. And, uh, and I think, well, that's got a hold. So then we carefully take uh, and it, put the pulleys on the cams and line them up where they need to be once the cams are close and then slide them in so that they aren't going to run anything into the pistons. And we put the engine at top dead center overlap so they're down about that far. And, uh, and we put the cams in and we put the belt on and tighten up the cylinder head and the valve cover and light her up and she starts right up. Boom. And no smoke, no nothing. It just ran great. And I ran the entire race and finished fifth. No. Yeah. <laughs> we got some. Jeff Richardson. That's the guy who built the engines. So uh, we get home and I say, get the motor out and take it over to Jeff's place. And they take it over there and he looks at it and he goes, what in the fuck have you done to this thing? It's got this young crap running down the sides of the engine and everything. Did it hold? And I said, well, it finished the race. It wasn't the most powerful guy out there. Chris Kraft was in the race, and a lot of good guys. And uh, they were beating me. Yeah, hot rod did a full that off. And we did it. I think, yeah. And at the, at the end of the race, the mechanics from the other teams are standing there watching us put this engine back together, and we put it, and we raced it. And it, yeah. I, I mean, yeah, it's just incredible. <laughs> just as a side note, what do you remember of Alan? the Cadenet at that point. I, I mean, loved him. He was a dear family, family friend. Well, let me tell you something. I, actually had, mm -hmm. I, think, I think he was very underrated. Yeah. First of all, he decided to go to Le Mans in a car of his own making, basically. Yeah. And he won it. It was pure. So who can, who can fault that? No, no. He was the nicest guy. I met him because his apartment and his muse was in the same, now. he backed up on that muse there. Well, you go down three doors and you're seeing the Barclays Bank race show. And that's where we were. And so I'd, I, the Barclays was in the city, so I'd take the, I lived in Hindhead, Surrey. So I'd jump on a bus and go down to, oh shit, uh, where Ron Dennis lived. Uh, oh God, the town, he's still there. McLaren's still there. Woking. Woking. So I'd go to Woking and jump the train. And the train would take me into, what was it, Waterloo or more? Waterloo from there, and me would take with Tube. Yeah. And so then I'd walk, as I'd go to the city and bullshit with the yeah. Barclays guys and go to lunch and stuff, and I'd always leave and go back to our muse shop and talk to the guys and look at the car and say, well, what about this? How about that? Come on, let's try to run lower this time. Let's go to the track too low and raise it up. Why do we go there high? and lower it, we, we go and hit the ground and then raise it up. That's how we do it. So I'd always make sure they did that that way. And Alan had come out and he said, hey, Buzz, what's up? Da, 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 da. What a character. Yeah, okay, yeah, he was a character. And um, one of the rather life. Bigger than life. And, and he, I didn't know whether he was 
an incredibly clever money hustling businessman or a rich cat. I, and I didn't care. I just knew he could do what he wanted to do. And he did what he wanted to do. And he, and what's whatever, if he bought a, a, a Bentley or a Rolls as a collector resale car, because he loved to buy them and sell them. He was always rolling cars. And he never, ever got beat up on a deal. Not that kind of, he, he, he told me that he owned like five GTOs. Oh God, cars. yes. And bought them for peanuts yeah. and sold them for a fortune. Yeah. And he was always doing that kind of stuff. And I really admired him. I did not have the resources to do it or I would have copied him. Because yeah. I'm a copycat. I, everything you see in here is a copy of somebody else's idea. Yeah. And, and so... Well, which, have, you, have you ever sat down with Aiden, his son? No. He should. He's, he, no, I had breakfast with him, lunch with him this week. And, or, and, yeah, this week. And, you know, to see him carry on his sort of dad's spirit, legacy. of mm -hmm. amazing Alan has such a, had such an attention to detail. Yeah. And, you know, it, right. exactly. You know, yeah. but it, yeah. it's just amazing. But the, those kind of personalities, one day Alan, a, a should come down and chat with you. Well, he was a Renaissance man. He was, right. And you all loved him. Oh. Guys yeah. wanted to be him. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, those were the days, though. I mean, yeah. let's talk about, I mean, because I'm sure, I mean, you've had your wife all the way through, but. No, I haven't. No, I've had two wives pass away. Oh, okay. Sorry. And this is my third wife. Wow. But we've been together for 30, 36 years. So kill me if I got that wrong. Th 36 years with a 10-year break, wow. which we did when I was too busy in racing and too busy trying to be successful and make money. What I was asked by a... I was being interviewed in St. Louis. I had won the race there the year before, and I was sort of the favorite to win again. And that's an awful racetrack. Did you ever have the misfortune of doing that? No. Anyway, so I'm like, oh, what am I doing here? So she takes me to a brand new mall for lunch, this newspaper woman. And we talk about this, and how are you going to do that? And you won here, and what do you like? How do you like St. Louis? Blah, blah, uh, so on. She said, you're a racing car driver. What frightens you? And I had never thought about that in my life. Nothing. And I didn't think for 10 seconds before I turned to her and said, being broke. That frightens me more than anything I've ever done in my life. And I operate on trying to get this sponsor to pay for that and this guy to buy this car and overhaul this car for this guy because... Now, during the course of our racing, we did cars for other people. And they weren't so successful. But we we gave them everything we did. I didn't hide anything. But And some did well, some not so much. But that was them. That was on them, I thought. But I it dawned on me there, I was so afraid of being broke, and my wife still bugs me today. We're remodeling our house right now, yeah. and it's going to cost $350,000 to remodel our house. But our house is worth millions because I bought it when it was worth nothing. And so I, she said to me, you know, you're making so much noise about this. We've got a little money in the bank. We can do this remodel. We haven't remodeled for 30 years. It's probably time. Everything's old and falling apart. And uh, I said, because I'm afraid of being broke, what if, what if this bank thing that's happening right now turns really ugly and my investments are not so good. And what happens? She said, Jim, we can lose a lot of money before we'll spend 350 grand. So, <laughs> so oh, you know, I, I, uh, I, I told you a story of, of my last yeah. race, uh, which involved your father. Yeah. And your father and I were friends at the time. And, um, and he was driving for Al. Yeah. And Al Holbert and I were friends. Uh, mortal enemies at the racetrack, but friends. Yeah. The swimming pool afterwards with our kids and yeah. so on and so forth. And I knew Al's wife well. And and um, and your dad was, your dad likes everybody and everybody likes your dad. Yeah. I mean, he is just absolutely the most is. personable, wonderful guy. And I got to know him on two levels. I got to race against him and then I got to be his friend. And I always wanted to have something go together with him, but he was always involved with somebody else who had a little better sponsorship and a better deal. And I didn't blame him. 
Uh, but my last race I did was, I like to think against your dad, because even as in Al car, Al's car, I was in the number 67 BF Goodrich car. My co-driver was Yoke and Mass, so we weren't any dummies. We were pretty good. Very I was good. now 48 or maybe even 49 years old, so I knew I was done. And I knew that Watkins Glen would be my last race. And I'm starting the race on the front row with your dad on the front row next to me. And I'm thinking to myself, my God, I must have arrived. That's Derek Bell. That's the guy that I idolized when I was building four banger engines at Charlie Hayes's. Mm -hmm. And I, my picture of your dad racing is the picture of him kneeling over the engine of a 917 trying to rehook the throttle linkage, which has broken. Yeah. And I'm thinking to myself, that's my guy. I like that guy. <laughs> and and I th he got it running. He and got it running and uh, the, the, of course, <laughs> knowing, him, knowing him, uh, you know, and where as family only can, the Bell's mechanical abilities <laughs> extend <laughs> probably not much more to shoving a piece of wood in the throttle assembly <laughs> to get it running. <laughs> I mean, we don't know much more, than that. <laughs> but, but uh, <laughs> you, you have to rebuild the whole thing. No, I mean, I'm glad you said that about that, but you also, <laughs> I think, and all the drives are amazing. I've got some great friends, whether they're from Andre Luffer to, to Rainer Van der Zander to Jet, you know, uh, the Taylor brother. I mean, there's just amazing yeah, yeah. talent. Yes. But I look at your generation, that's generation, <laughs> as do a huge swath of IMSA fans, right? Yeah. And Indy Car guys for their heroes, the Rutherfords and the Andretti, and then the NASCAR guys for the Earnhardt and the Wall Trips, you know, the that 80s 90s era to me the guys were bigger my dad's hands were strong oh yeah, yeah. the physicality of it yeah. yes you put in a cool suit but you know another one with two drivers you well know. and every cool suit failed so every don't don't think that yeah when they got hot water yeah i mean yeah we've all had that shit and then yeah. but i look at the i love seeing pictures of the old drivers please yeah and you see everyone sitting there and Back to your thing about Mario, this is, I guess I'm rambling a bit, but Mario, I asked, as I did Jack and Stuart, when you were in the driver's briefing, who you'd look on around and only when you've been there as a driver, do you know that everyone has their inner fears? Yeah. Everyone has yes. their inner monologue that's saying, am I good enough today? Is my car good? Right. Right. Is, is Jackie going to be on form? You know that happens to everyone. Less so for Mario and, and Gurney and Phil Hill and yeah. Jackie Stewart. But who did you look at in the room? And Mario was funny because obviously... Yeah. Was, Mario yeah. was rarely in the room with me as a result of him doing IndyCar and yeah. me doing sports cars. Uh, but when I was affiliated with him, when he would drive for Al or Porsche would put him in a car yeah. or something like that, then I'd see him. And he was the coolest customer in the room. You just knew. You, well, you couldn't read him. Yeah. He just was there. And if he had something to say, it was important and short. Yeah. And, uh, and he never made eye contact in a threatening way. He never tried to intimidate anybody. He just was intimidating. He was that way, and he's a small guy. Who else was like that? Who, who else? Because obviously he's, he really got, you had a huge respect in him. Oh. But who else out of those incredible drivers did you just go? Alan Balancer yeah. Senior really? was good that yeah. way. He was man of few words. Um, Bobby Enter, on the other hand, was a big mouth, opinionated about everything, and yeah. and always pissing somebody off, or being pissed at somebody, yeah. and shooting off his mouth. Well, I mean that's just him, yeah. and 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 that's way he that's the way he operated. Yeah. Um, John Fitzpatrick was a very very good racing car driver who who was always friendly and nice to everybody, but he knew exactly what he was going to do to you or somebody else at the time. Yeah. He, he was always involved uh, with a head game, and he was really good at it. And, and, not, and, and I, when, I, when he, he tie-wrapped me into the car when the seatbelts wouldn't buckle, and sent me out, and the engine failed, and I sat on the backside of Sebring for four hours before anyone would come and cut the tie wraps to get me out of the car. And I'm thinking, what if this thing was on fire right now? 
had no one thought about them. <laughs> so, so, but he just did it to go. I mean, we got to go, Jim. It's time to go. There's a great picture of him staring into the car, looking down at my crotch, and and I'm looking down at my crotch, and it looks like he's fondling me, but he's not. He's tie wrapping all these seat belts together and sending me out yeah. at Sebring, where we're leading by a lap, and we end up losing the race. The engine, the, the drive shaft failed, but uh, and left me stranded on the car on that very back part of Sebring where there's no corner workers. You're just sitting out there lined up on that airstrip and nobody comes. And you just sit there and sit there and you're waving your arm out the window, but nobody can see you. And somebody that came rushing by in a car probably reported that I'm still sitting in a car out there. You better go check and see what he's doing. And did he? Obviously the other part about that whole 70s, 80s, 90s race, especially 70s and 80s, is we didn't have social media. We didn't have nothing. The drivers, it was a tour that will the Europeans came over here. I mean, dad said it. My mom, our family, no one's wife knew what they were up to when they came over here. No, no, so being the other side of the world, no, which you were. Right. But I mean, there was a great feeling of camaraderie and some terrible shenanigans. <laughs> right? I mean, beyond. I drove for the Whittington brothers, and we won. I put the car on the pole at Mid Ohio, won the race with Bill, and I did the majority of the race because Bill was very new at it, and we had done some chassis setup for them here. Their cars were really struggled. So, as an example, the cars would leave here, those big yellow orange cars. And by the way, there was never a brown bag full of money. There were always checks. They were honest and decent and straightforward. Never ever did anything sketchy come into this building or leave this building, none of them ever suggested anything. The pillowcase is full of cocaine and the brown paper yeah, bags. So it's mean, all bullshit. Yeah, yeah. It's all, somebody made that up mm. because it never happened. So I would, they would, the car, the truck would leave here with Jim Bell and head for Portland. Yeah. And so then I would fly to Portland on the Friday where they'd rented the track and sort the car, springs, Anti roll bars, ride height, all the stuff. And Bill didn't care who knew I was involved. Don hated it. So Don demanded that when I was done on Friday, I was on an airplane and out of there, and nobody knew I'd ever been there. Wow. And then they'd race and they'd do pretty well. I always thought Bill was a little better driver than Don, but Don was pretty damn good. And the kid, he never got to the point where he was a great driver, but he could he could get the car around the track and then he passed away. But but the uh, craziest thing was, is we're at, this is the first of the private jets and all that kind of stuff is just beginning to happen. The rest of us are driving the truck, pulling the car to the racetrack. Yeah. And, um, and it's on a flatbed trailer outside. And so I'm, I'm, we win the race. No, I win the race with somebody else. Yeah, no, I win the race with Bill. I'm standing in the gas station there, which used to be where you'd pull the cars in and they'd say, that's the, the impound, but nobody did anything. You just opened a beer and had a, a, a party after the race. So Bill and I win. I see Don walk by and he doesn't say anything to us. Congratulations, nothing, and he just kind of vanishes. So we get through the prize giving and all that stuff and I give Leo Mel my steering wheel and he gives it away in a, he was the head of Goodyear at the time. And he gives it away to a poor kid somewhere that was a fan. I, I, I turn to Bill and I say, hey, listen, I'm gonna try to hit, hitch a ride on Howard Meister's jet to go home and my guys are gonna drive the truck home. He said, well, I got kind of a transportation problem here, that little tiny airport next near the racetrack there in Lexington. My brother is so pissed off about us winning the race that he took off in the plane without me. He left me here. And I, I, don't, have a, I don't have a ride anywhere. I, I don't know how to get anywhere. I said, well, what would you do? He said, well, I'd get on a commercial flight out of Cleveland, but I got to get to Cleveland. So I think, shit, okay, well, I'll, I guess I'll go to, out of Cleveland, too. I'll tell Howard I'm not going with him, because Howard at Mid-Ohio well, would always ride me home on his plane. But so I had, I drove Bill to uh, Cleveland, put him on an airplane, and I got on my airplane, and we got out of there, turned in my rental car and got out of there. 
But that was the kind of shenanigans that went on during the latter day, days of the 80s where it was really competitive and people got nasty with each other and pulled stunts on each other and all that kind of stuff. And the Whittington brothers were the first ones to pull stunts on each other. They were. But I never, ever in all my days with them and racing with them and knowing Don and racing with Bill, whom I really liked as a person, and he was a hell of a good race driver, really good. He became really good. Um, Dad said that. He said he was legit. He was the real deal. When he put a car on the outside of the second row at Indy, he put it there. Yeah. That didn't happen because of luck. Wow. He was. Well, so you never saw anything from that lot, but it was obviously there was, you knew there was crazy amounts of money being, <laughs> like money in the car, Hulk Kramer, the mall, you know, we know all that stuff. They, but then you have the, res the re emergence of Randy Lanier, who's in documentaries and everything. Don't get me started. <laughs> I, I don't, you know, I'm sorry, but that whole thing, you know, he was a man who found his way by doing a lot of time in prison and dealing with himself and thinking about his transgressions and everything that he did. And now that he's famous again, now he's famous again for for all the wrong stuff. Yeah. So I'm sorry. I, I just, it doesn't work with me. And, you know, I had a situation come up where because I was spending a lot of money you know, it was nothing for us to have a $6 million a year. Wow. Um, and that went on for years. And people, of course, thought I was filthy rich and you lived, shit I was making every deal I could make. And I had a lot of help from the Cox newspaper people because Garner Anthony had come in here and asked me to build him a Mercedes Benz. And I said, I can't. I'm under contract to BMW. I can't do that. He said, then build me a BMW. I said, well, where, where do you live? He said, I live in Atlanta. And I said, well, what's the Hawaii phone number? And he said, well, I, I have a home in Hawaii too. Okay, never mind. Can you build me a BMW? So I called Jochen Nirpash, who's a good friend, and by the way, very, very sick right now. I don't know if it was passed, but he's very close. And uh, I called Jochen and I said, hey, you know, I, now that I'm under contract to you, I replaced Ronnie Peterson when he was killed and couldn't take the, that 320, which is sitting there right now. So um, he said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want, to t I want to take a 633 and I want to turbocharge it, put a Getrek gearbox in it. I want to do all the stuff for my sponsor. Mm -hmm. He says he's going to sponsor me. So I come back to him and I said, I think I can do that. He said, okay, so I come in here and you got holes in your Levi's and everything else, and I see that uh, Danny Angaius has sponsorship from Ted Field, who's in the publishing business, which is the business I'm in. And I said, oh, really? See, I, I do business with Ted's brother. I don't know his name, Bob Field or whatever his name is. And he said, but I look at you and you're racing against Angaius in Ted Field's cars and it always looks to me when I come in here that looks like the wolf's at the door. And I said, well, there's holes in my jeans because I work hard, but, I, you know, I'm eating, and we're getting along. And he says, well, how does Danny Angaius do it? He doesn't have any money. And I said, well, Ted Field backs him with everything. Indy cars, whatever he wants. Lots of 935s, I don't care. He said, well... Who's your sponsor? And I said, well, BMW helps me out a lot, and Ocean Motors, uh, BMW helps me. He's a friend. And so, and I get by. I get by with a little prize money and so on and so forth, and I do work for outside people. And he said, well, are you going to build me the car? And I said, sure, I'll do it as long as you'll take a BMW. So we get that going, and he calls me, and he says, you know, why don't you come out to my office in Atlanta and tell me what it takes to sponsor you? like Ted Field does with Danny and Gaius. You must have just not known what to say. And I said, well, what do you mean? I mean, I'm kind of, I'm married to BMW, and that's costing them some money, and, and I've got Ocean Motors BMW, and I've got oil spot companies, and, you know, I'm doing okay. He said, well, what, what do you think it would cost? And I said, probably $250,000 for the year, and I'd like to do it for three years. 
He says, why don't you make up a presentation and fly out to Atlanta and meet with me and my board of directors? So I say, okay, I'm coming. I get a call from his secretary who says, you're on. It's a done deal. It's such and such a date. I will see you then. Great. The day before I'm to leave, I've bought a new suit. I've got a new tie. I got the whole deal. I'm ready to go. I've sat down and drawn out a flow chart and the whole thing. Mr. Anthony regrets to tell you that he can't make your meeting. And how many times have we heard that? And You're right. Hundred on bullshit. Same on bullshit. And he said, but he said as he was leaving the office to call and, and beg off on the meeting, but that he owes me, but he owes you money. And I, he didn't tell me how much, and he said, you'd know. And I said, no, 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 the BMW is paid for, the, the bare chassis is here, I've got the engine coming, the turbocharger's here, Ketrick gearbox is laying on the floor, it's a done deal, and he's paid every single bill the second that an invoice came, boom, he paid it. He said, no, it's not that, it's not the car. He says he owes you some money and he can't remember how much it is. And I said, does it have anything to do with the meeting that we were gonna have today? And she said, yeah, I think that's it. Did, didn't, didn't he have to give you some money for racing or something? And I said, well, I was gonna make my presentation for $250,000 for three years on a three-year running basis. Um, and, and then he would pay me a fee of $5,000 a race to drive. And he said, she said, yeah, that sounds right, but, right, but doesn't the, the 5,000 come before each race? and then there's a lump sum of 250,000 up front. And I said, well, that would be my presentation. She said, I thought that's what it was. What's your address? And mails me a check for $250,000 and a $5,000 driver retainer check with it. And then he sponsored me for 10 years yeah. after that, 10 years. When I drove, I changed. I changed my life, my career changed everything. And he passed away at 92 years old two years ago, and uh, and he was just the nicest guy in the world, and took great. He was a health food nut, and well, I so I I would ask him during he would come and stay with us at our house when he was in the states, and I'd say I got to ask you a question. You got this perfect jet that's the same color as the BMW I just painted. That's Pacific Blue Porsche color, and he says, Yeah, I like that the best. So I paint everything that color. My airplane's that color. I said, It is. Well, what do you have? Well, I got a jet. And I said, why do you have that? And he says, well, my offices are in Atlanta. I live in Honolulu, and my ranch is in Australia. So we have two G5s, and one goes back and forth with my wife to the ranch in Australia, to our cattle ranch, and the other one takes me. It's a house. It's got a bedroom in it and a kitchen and everything, and it takes me to Atlanta from Honolulu, and then and then I have a house, and I, he bought a thoroughbred farm in Bonsall down here. And he's next door to the guy who owns um, Gulfstream. Yeah. What's that guy's name? Anyway, and they have two thoroughbred ranches. And he's got indoor tennis courts, swimming pools, and all that stuff. So I said, I, so okay. He says, but I, I'm going to be in Atlanta next week, and I want to see my car. And I said, well, why don't you just come down to the shop? It's here. I've been driving, and it works great. He says, he says I'll call you. Okay. So I'm sitting at my desk. And the phone rings, and it's all garbled. And I say, hello, 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 hello. And an operator cuts in and says, oh, you're getting a call from an airplane, and it's, it's coming into John Wayne Airport, and he wants to talk to you, but I think he's trying to tell you to meet him there with his car. Does that make any sense? And I said, yes, it does. And she said, good. She said, go to the FBO, the, the jet center. Don't go to the airport. Okay, and uh, so I'm coming on MacArthur Boulevard to off the freeway, and I look up, and here comes a G5, the exact same color as the car I'm driving, oh, wow. coming in like this. Yeah. Touches down, I turn left, go down to the FBO, walk up to the door, and a man swings the door up, and he says, you're Jim Busby, and I said, that's right. And he said, Mr. Anthony called ahead from his plane and said that, I were to let you in and he wants you to come out on the uh, tarmac and see his airplane. 
okay? Is this real? Is this really happening? I've just gotten all this dough from him. I'm in his car. I, I don't know anything about the guy. And um, he, uh, he, he, he's in sneakers and jeans and a white T-shirt. And there's two guys that operate the plane standing on either side of him. And he walks down the ramp on this thing. And he says, come here, you got to see this. It's the coolest thing ever. And he takes me up in the airplane, and it's a big living room with a kitchenette, and the whole back of the airplane is a bedroom with television and all kinds of stuff. And Welcome to another <laughs> and, and I'm going, oh, my God. And he says, it's just the coolest thing in the world because I have to spend three days a week in Atlanta running the company, Cox Enterprises, car auctions, um, Cox newspapers, 17 major daily newspapers, uh, Cox Enterprises, which is the... the all the auto auctions, Cox Television, Radio Network, and he's the CEO. He's the head man. His wife is a Cox, and he married the father, ran for president in 1927 or something, and he, the company was failing, and he was the lawyer for the company, and the wife married him and gave him the company, and he turned it into this conglomerate, wow. which exists today. Amazing. What a story. Deep. <laughs> Jeez, I mean, we could talk forever. We really could. I think we'll have to do three at least. But, you know, you've seen so much. You've achieved so much, which was of your part. You didn't know you were going to be oh, no. sitting here like this. Oh, no, no. I thought I would work for Charlie Hayes building four bangers. That was it. I really did. But if you, I mean, <laughs> and which would have been okay on its own. It was for me. But, yeah. But now this has all happened. Um, sorry, the sign that says 24 hours later, but it's not 24 hours, it's 50. How many years in the short 50 years? Or 50 years, but that nose, is, that nose is as it finished the race with your dad in the car 24 hours after it started. Love it. And that you found it. <laughs> and I found it in Canada. But I'm thinking to myself, what do you, you know, you've got kids, you've got grandkids. Mm -hmm. You've got bracket? Yes. 19. 19. Well, so what would you say? You've got 19 grandchildren. So everything works. Um, so the whole family is a big dynasty. What do you tell kids? Imagine if anyone bothered, bothered to ask you, what are you thinking? Especially when we look at the world we live in today, just our final thought on, you know, what's a good role for living? What's your role for living? It seems like you made a lot up on the way, like all of this, but what would your, what's the message you'd want to leave which could help other people? Because of the state of the world today, they don't listen much. And my kids are all good kids, wonderful kids. But they've had their struggles, and they've been through their chemical problems, a couple of them, and so on and so forth. But they're wonderful people, mm. and they get it. And, and yet they struggle with this world and, and what's expected and mostly what's not expected of this generation. Yeah. That worries me a lot. And all I've ever said is I got up every morning and I went to work and did the best I could. And sometimes that was minor league stuff and sometimes it was major league stuff. And I never, ever worked any harder on the major league stuff that I did on the minor league stuff because it all took you where you were going. If you don't put the fuel in your tank when it's, you're trying to get to work, you're not getting to work. And so the stop at the gas station is the most important stop of the day. Wow. And I've never lived my life any other way. And I've never been afraid to have the most well-funded team in racing at the time and pull the valve cover off and look at the valves because I heard a rattle. I've never, ever felt any different about the technical side of my life than I do today. And it doesn't matter, My, I'm going to drive the contractor that's helping us remodel our house out of her mind. Sure. Because when she brought the initial plans yesterday afternoon and laid them out on the kitchen table, I punched holes in every single thing that I thought could be problematic. Not her designs, they were fabulous, and not her concepts or even her ideas. But the, but the way she did her draws to get the money, that had to be, as the bank said, it can't be some, hey, by the way, send me this, or it had to be done right. And I think that if you tried, when I knocked out the engine benches here 
and found 90, there's one, two, three Le Mans cups right there. Yeah. They were up in a cabinet in the front garage corroding and because they didn't have any place to put them. And so when I, I hired my uh, one of my grandsons to come in the afternoons after school and polish every one of these trophies, you couldn't even see some of them. They were so awful. And that's the one your dad and I got at Daytona right there. And on and on. So we and these medals were in a paper bag and the and the ribbons were rotted. But I'd never let them I knew where they were. I knew what they were. I knew how many they were. I I always knew every thing. And and you see I have a lot of books and a lot more at home. As I as I told you, I read books on learning how to communicate with people. And every time a good race driver puts out a book, I buy it and read it. Yeah. Because I want to know what they thought and what they did. And if somebody, if a current racing car driver did, I'd buy that book too. Yeah. I would. And so you've, I, just, you've loved this well. You've loved it. I, and I've you never known anything it. else. It's all I've ever known. Yeah. And I'm afraid that if I'd had to make a real living at a real job, that I'd have failed miserably. And, you know, I had a, a close friend who's now really struggling. And we had met at Ferrari. When I did the Ferrari deal, I had no idea. I thought I was buying a car for investment to flip and make some money on. And I, for 400 grand, I bought an ex Schumacher pole winning Formula One car running perfect new engine from a guy who was going through a terrible divorce in Europe. And uh, so I, I get it. I call, I don't want to have it shipped here. I want it to go to Ferrari. So I call Andrea Galetti, who I know. He's running, he was a head of Formula One, then he became head of Cliente Formula One. And a great guy and a good friend of mine. He comes here every time he's in the States and we're good friends. Um, he told me I was out of my mind when I took that 400 and turned it into a hot ride and he, now he comes by and he goes, I love this car so much, start it up for me, I wanna hear it. And so uh, I, 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 I called him and I said, hey Andrea, this guy in Germany's kind of having some trouble and he's got this Formula One car, which is an ex Schumacher pole winner. A 97 F310B, it's that car right there. And, uh, and I said, I wanna buy it and flip it and make some money. And he said, okay, well have him send it down here and then tell him you'll wire the money of the whole 425 grand to him in Germany the moment I call you and tell you the car is good. And, and he says, he can get here in five or six hours, no problem. So I get a call from Galetti and he says, the car's here. And so what are we doing? And I said, you're gonna look at that car and tell me that it starts and runs, it's history, everything else, because and then I'm gonna just wire this guy 425 grand. So I'm standing here in America getting ready to throw away a half a million dollars. Yeah which is harder in money. And uh, <laughs> he calls me back the next day and he says, she fired right up. It's got the Schumacher seat in it. When you flip it up, it's got his name written on the back of it. And, uh, and it runs great. It, you know, I did the history on the engine. It's brand new. We put it in. Uh, car hasn't run since. And you need to buy it. And I said, okay. So I send the guy 425 grand. A week later, Andretti Gillespie calls me. And he says, have you heard of Cliente F1? I said, no. He said, why don't you fly over here right now and drive this car at Fiorano? I said, listen, I'm doing historic Formula One now, but I've never driven a paddle yeah. Formula One car. I don't know what the hell that's all about. He said, believe me, it's a lot easier. You don't have the age pattern, nothing. Clickety, clickety, left foot brake. You got this. I don't think so. I talked to my wife. I said, Ferrari wants me to come over and drive this car, and I think they want to talk to me about helping him out selling cars in America, Formula One cars. But I don't know, and they're paying for it, so here I go. So I arrive there, and there's a new driving, Marlboro driving suit, which, by the way, sadly has been stolen, but I did replicate it. Uh, Marlboro, a whole enchilada, looking like a big guy now. And so I get stretched into the suit, and then I, I get in the seat, they make a seat for me and everything, and I keep saying, well, why am I here? What am I doing here? Well, you're gonna have some fun on our nickel and drive the car around Fiorano, this Formula One car. I said, well, I've never been to Fiorano. I don't know where I'm going. So the next day, the, they transport the car out the back door 
through the fence, down that street, back in, and now you're at Ferrana. That's how you get there. And Enzo's house is right there. So there's a red helicopter sitting on the ground just past the start-finish line on the right-hand side on the pit exit. And, uh, and then there's a new Ferrari. This is right before Monaco. And uh, there's a new Ferrari sitting there uh, in the garage, and there's mechanics all around it. And then Michael Schumacher gets out of it and comes walking over and says, Hi. And I say, Hi. And he says, Are you over at Enzo's house? Yeah, I'm going to, I guess I'm going to change my clothes there. And he says, Well, I got to go over and take a shower. So you come on over with me. I'll let you in the front door and we'll do this and so on. And it was, so what do you do? Uh, you like motorcycles? I said, Yeah, I like motorcycles a lot. You've seen the picture of the one we built for him. Um, and he says, oh, no kidding, really? So tell me, tell me about these Saturday night specials, these bobbers, where you lower them down and they make sparks and do all that shit. And, and I said, well, yeah, we, we do that. And I, as a kid, I did that. I built them. And he said, but I like Triumphs because they started out better than the Harley. Well, yeah, but and these Harleys are pretty cool. I've got a couple of Harleys in Switzerland, you know, at my house. And uh, I said, okay. So he goes in, and, uh, and, and uh, he's been there for two days. And the helicopter's going to take him back to Bologna to get on his plane because they can't land it there and go home for dinner. That's what he does. And so, uh, but he's just this regular guy. He's just a completely regular guy. And he says, he says, so what are you doing with this thing? And I said, I have no idea. I think I've been dragged into a funny deal here. And he says, well, they're really easy, you know. You know, getting the last few tenths out of them is really hard. But other than that, I've driven some of those old age pattern cars with lots of pedals, and they're not easy. Yeah. And uh, he says, but these are easy. It's just not easy to go fast. Yeah. And I said, I'm not going fast. I'm just going to troll around. I, I have no idea of your racing history. Nothing. No, he's no, just no. a nice guy. Just being friends. It's just bullshit. Yeah. And he's getting ready to go home anyway, and the helicopter's sitting there for him. Yeah. And um, so... So he gets in the shower, and I'm out there getting stretching into my suit, and he comes out, and he says, okay, you look the part, so we're good. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, and I, I look in the bathroom, there's wet towels on the floor, and he's been there for two days, and he's turned this into his own crash pad. Yeah. And, and I'm sitting on Enzo's bed talking to him, and this is all happening to the kid from the body shop yeah. in Pasadena. And I'm saying, this isn't real. And, and three days before that, I'm booking an airplane ticket for to Italy for a reason I have no idea why. I just got wound up and wanted to do it because the car was there. Yeah. And um, I get in the car and I go out and it's very, very easy to drive. It's tough. The, 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 the catch point on the clutch is very difficult. Very, very difficult. And they're trying to adjust it and I'm stalling the engine and the whole deal. So we finally get that sorted. I go out, paddle around for a while and feel pretty good, and I finally, it's the automatic downshift version. So what you do is you come out on the straight there at that sweeper, and you start down the straight, and you can see the bridge. By the time you get to the bridge, you're already up in high gear, and you've already begun to select second gear. But you're still going. And when you let off on the throttle and tap the brakes, the car starts downshifting. Boom, 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 to second. Go through the corner and start selecting up again. And then when you want to select down, You've already pre-selected that gear, and when you let off on the throttle and tap the brakes, it starts downshifting. And so you don't do any downshifting. They did change that, and that's not legal today. No. You have to up and downshift. But at the time, that was the car. Anyway, I end up driving that car, and they end up selling a couple of cars to people I know. I tell them, hey, this is really cool. Steve Bren, remember Bren, the, the, the company, the Irvine company, Kevin Wieda, who you just met, he bought two of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just called him and said, "This." so I'm, I'm at Monaco. I've set the fastest lap at Monaco. And nah, Burris, that car, that car right there. And that's the picture that somebody made of it. And, and there's, oh, there's a poster in there with me at the fastest lap going up through Massonet on the fastest lap. Who would have thought you'd have ever done I have no idea. Dad, two weeks ago, two weeks earlier, I had no idea I'd even be there. And now I'm at Monaco, and they've given me the special pass, which I got hung here somewhere, 
where you come out of the Hotel de Paris back door and go through that tunnel, come out through the train station and wind up in the paddock. So you don't have to go on the street. And I thought these guys were traipsing down the streets, being big heroes and everything. No, you just go direct. I had no the idea. Story. Yeah, wow. So I do that. So then, and, and for the weekend, I do the fastest lap. And everybody's saying, oh, you're hot. I, should. I, was, I was 59 years old. Fastest lap in the F1 car. And, and so, so anyway, I'm standing in the, I got out of the car and the, my mechanics are all the Ferrari F1 guys and they're slapping me and saying, hey, dude, you're going to get some pizza and ice with us. And, and I got a poster here that Michael gave me in the pizzeria, oh. which he signed. It's in the other room. Uh, and I, so I look out and I see this guy that looks so familiar to me. I think, God, I knew that guy from Speedway Bikes when we were the importer for Westlake. And I, that's Kevin Weta. And that guy standing with him, that's Steve Brand. He drove with uh, your dad at uh, Elkhart Lake. I, he, he calls me and he says, do you ever have an opening? I said, funny enough, B Miller High Life just called. He's a good IndyCar driver. He wasn't no slouch. And... Uh, and I'd, I'd called your dad and I said, hey, listen, they want to run the other car, the Porsche-sponsored car at Elkhart Lake. And who am I going to, co how am I going to get to co-drive with you? And he says, I don't know. Uh, think about it and let me know and I'll think about it. And, uh, and Steve Brand calls and he says, do you ever have anything going on? I said, can you drive a 962? And he said, sure. I drive any cars. And um, I said, okay. You're on. You want to run Elkhart Lake? You've done well there in the IndyCar. I know that. And he says, uh, he says, how much is it going to cost me? I said, wait a minute. This is Busby Racing. We pay guys. We don't. You don't bring money to us. Yeah. We pay you. He says, what? I've never had that before. He's paid for every ride he's ever had. And I said, well, uh, you get five grand. Same thing I paid your dad. You get five grand in your expenses and. Uh, you're good to go, plus prize money. He says, we got a bad connection here. <laughs> what do we do? We, you pay me? Yeah, okay. So I did, and Steve drove with us. Well, the other guy standing with Kevin out there, is, who's now working for his father and making millions of dollars a year, has taken his dad's airplane and flown from Orange County to, what's the airport right there by Monaco? Uh, oh, God. Oh, I did. That, that it's a town. Yeah. Anyway, and then helicoptered over to meet the yacht that he rented and backed up to the swimming pool at Monaco. And they're standing there, and they're standing there looking at me and saying, Buzz, what's happening? And I go, oh my God, what are you guys doing here? Oh, 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 oh. So I said, hey, come in here. And I introduced him to all the Ferrari guys and I take him over to Galetti who's running the show. And I said, hey, these are my buddies and they like fancy cars and they're both pretty good race drivers and stuff like that. What is this? So I, they say, well, come eat lunch with us. So I take all the Ferrari mechanics and Andrea Galetti, and we cross that gate that goes by the swimming pool without going into the crowd and winds up at the yachts. We go up on the back of the yacht and we're met, which I got to drive in the afternoon, so I don't get the champagne, but they all get a little glass of champagne and the Ferrari guys drink all day anyway. And so, and they have these tuna sandwiches and everything made and all these trays around the deck of this yacht that Steve has rented somewhere else and had driven to Monaco and backed up to the swimming pool. A big yacht. I mean, it's, it's bigger than this building. And, and that night, they get on Steve's jet and Kevin and Steve fly down to Maranello and buy two Formula One cars that night. And when I get back to the track in the morning, everybody in Ferrari is giving me these. <laughs> I said, what happened? What did I do? Well, you're really fast and everything's good. We think you're going to be fastest lap because the other guys didn't know what they were doing. You also sold two more cars. Sold two cars that night. That's crazy. Well, and then a lot more were sold after that. So they ended up saying, we want to come to America. Can you talk to Steve, um, you know, Laguna Seca, Steve oh. Earl? Steve Earl, who can be pretty difficult at, at best. So I called him and I said, would you like to have Ferrari Cliente F1 there for your event? 
And as long as you'd give them the whole garage and that sign in there is the one we made for them, I can put that together. So I flew to Italy and I put it together with management and Andrea. We talked about how it would work and stuff like that. And I bought a lot of California wine to give away to all the Ferrari people to take home. And, and they stored their equipment here. And so I said, well, that's now the Ferrari room because I was already downsizing that's everything. So and that's why we still call it the Ferrari room because everything they gave me that they didn't take home is still there. Wow. And then I ended up selling that car for a million dollars and you know, look up another bad deal. <laughs> oh, but listen, Timothy, <laughs> so you, you are legendary for your <laughs> storytelling <laughs> and this is <laughs> one I'd ever seen and I would always. Well, it uh, would be fun to do some more. Yeah. And if there's any specific thing you'd like to do regarding sort of that era, I still have a pretty good memory of all of it, and, and I had the benefit of being friends with everybody that was there. What, what, what I'd actually like to do, I was thinking, it, well, not for this song, because, but you know, maybe another event when everyone's in town, is actually do like a round table with a group of you. Wouldn't as, that be fun? As just, and I just have the cameras, we just roll, we have them. At, like, you know what would be fun? A nice wine and just let it flow. Uh, there's gonna be several people, lots of people, circulate through this building yeah. during this Long Beach. Yeah. How about if we, I moved this table and these chairs and we put a round table right here. Be perfect. And everybody that would go through here would recognize some of these pictures yeah. from something, somewhere, and then uh, yeah, we, we do it do, right here. We could do it right here. And literally it would just, the conversation would just all you guys as peers talking to each other, the God. stories, and it's un it just goes. You know, I mean, it, it would be so fun. That would be fun, and we can and we can cater it and get a really nice. I got a wine guy that would yeah. knock your socks off, and uh, and he's the at my yacht club, he's the mater d, okay. and and he gets the price well, for nothing. This room is a gymnasium during the day, but at night it's fun too, yeah. because there's lots of stuff going on out there that ended up coming out of here. So, and we could sit here and gab about every one of those cars has a story and people and and we could remember every driver that I ever, I can remember two days of testing with Jackie Eeks at Vysock and there I have a picture of me standing in my driving suit. My car's done and it's in the truck. He's in the car that your dad and he won Le Mans with going out for the last run and I'm looking at him and he's looking at the instruments of this 962 and pulling out mm -hmm. and he wins that weekend and I win that weekend and, and the two cars that we tested for those two days they're together. He's coming, he's the grand, he's sis, Grand Marshal Longby. He's the guy. And he's the R and see maybe we can get him and dad's going to come over. The so baby. much fun. Yeah. Jim. That would be, that was so good. In a girl forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much for listening or watching Life With Legends. Uh, I love doing it. And so don't forget to share the podcast to your friends if you did enjoy it. And thank you so much for your support. Also, remember, visit lifewithlegends.com to catch up on past episodes and check out what I think are some beautiful portraits I've taken of all my guests. Available for sale in limited edition prints. Anyway, guys, thanks so much. I look forward to you joining me again next week.